trying to compose myself. <laughs> a rare occasion where we actually do know what was she thinking. That does it for us tonight. Banfield starts now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday. It's good to have you here. Uh, thank you. I always am so appreciative that you join me on this program. Uh, we work very hard all day long to uh, find some of the top stories, and today it was a boon. And when I say that, it's because we have three very, very big interviews that are coming your way. Uh, let me start with the top one, and that is that uh, there was some stuff that was dropped in uh, the court filing today by Pastor John Paul Miller's ex-wife. That would be the wife before Micah Miller. Micah Miller, the young woman who police say took her own life after many alleged all kinds of abuse by her husband, the pastor. He says no, he hasn't been charged, but the allegations now seem to really be piling in from his wife before Micah. Let me just give you a little taste before I go into the details. Multiple affairs, prostitutes, inappropriate behavior with teenagers at the church. Okay, I'm going to give you all of this information, also tell you how there was a slight win today in court for Micah's family, and then Micah's father and the family attorney for Micah are going to be here live to tell all about it. Um, Then the next thing, bombshell in Italy. I did not see this coming. I fully expected Amanda Knox would get on that plane and go to Italy and get the all clear for the final time. And that didn't happen. Instead, an Italian court convicted her today. Again. How many times are they going to convict this woman? If you've lost count, uh, don't feel bad. I had to reread a lot. This is not for murder. That's done. That was wrongful murder. It was thrown out once and for all. But the Italians had already done a little side hustle on, on defamation. Because while she was being interrogated, she said, maybe you should check my boss. And under Italian law, you can't do that. So they tried her, and they convicted her. And then they threw the conviction out for that defamation. And then they decided to try her again. But it really looked like it wasn't going to fly. Maybe that's why Amanda flew. There she was in court to hear yet again from the Italians guilty. She is going to appeal, and guess who's talking to me tonight about it? Yes, Raffaello Solecito, her boyfriend who went through this whole ordeal with her. The wrongful conviction, the throwing out of the verdict, all of the above. He didn't think this was going to happen today either. He is live for his first exclusive interview. Uh, Don't go anywhere. Make sure you see what he has to say about what happened today in his country. And then there is some extremely disturbing jailhouse video that I have to show you tonight. And I'm just going to warn you, I'm going to give you a lot of fair warning. Uh, If there's anybody who's, you know, squeamish, if there's anybody who's uh, easily triggered or upset by disturbing videos, um, you cannot watch this. I hate to tell you to turn the channel, and I'm not going to say that, but maybe just turn it down and maybe leave the room. I'll give you the warning again as we get closer. But this is a teenager who was taken off to jail, really shouldn't have been there, and severely autistic. And because he was severely autistic, the only way to get the the pain and the voices in his head to stop without meds is to bang his head against the wall. And that's what he continually did. And these officers, um, they didn't help him. They, They mocked him. And he banged his head against the wall so many times, ultimately he died, begging for medication. We're going to talk about how this could happen, unless you think this is some small town where maybe they don't recognize mental health issues. Nope. Nope. Major American city. Okay. Uh, The father of that teenager is going to be on with me live tonight, so don't go anywhere. I want to know what they're doing for that family. But tonight I also need to pull back the curtain for a hot minute. And I I need to talk about some stories that we cover and then some stories that we don't cover and why that is. Uh, When a private citizen dies by suicide, that is a tragedy. It is rarely a crime, rarely a mystery, and almost never is it anybody else's business. And the same goes when a private citizen is the subject of rumors and whisper suspicions, um, but is not being accused or suspected by police nor charged with any crime. But then came the Micah Miller story to blow up that rule book again and again and again. 
Micah died in April. I think you know this by now, right? And though the police in North Carolina ruled that the fatal gunshot was self-inflicted, and they offered a lot of evidence to prove that, Micah's friends and family and many other people who never even met her, they're not buying this. Micah's death came uh, just two days after she served her estranged and seemingly abusive husband, John Paul, with divorce papers. John Paul Miller is the founder and the senior pastor of a church in Myrtle Beach called Solid Rock Ministries. In the weeks and months before Micah died, the pastor admitted to placing GPS trackers on her car, to slashing her tires, and to posting a topless photo of her online. He wasn't then, and he isn't now, charged with anything. And so in the eyes of the law, he is as innocent as you or as I am, um, and he is just as deserving of the privacy. But now comes a litany of new and really scandalous allegations, and they come from the first Mrs. John Paul Miller, the wife of Pastor Miller, uh, 16 years before he married Micah. Her name is Allison Williams. And she is right now asking a South Carolina court for sole custody of their two youngest children, both of them teenagers. Uh, The filings uh, were made public, just made public. And in them, Ms. Williams claims that John Paul was repeatedly unfaithful to her and that he regularly hired prostitutes while they were still married. She says his affair with Micah began when Micah was their family nanny. And worst of all, she alleges that John Paul was, and I'm just going to go ahead and quote her here, inappropriate, sexually inappropriate, with several underage female members of the Solid Rock Church. William says the girls told her as much themselves, but were afraid to report it. She says when they went to the police, they told her that no one would believe her because... Well, he was a well-known pastor, and she was the wife who was divorcing him. And through it all, wife number one, Allison Williams, says that she and Micah stayed friends. Let that sink in for a minute. And that not that long ago, Micah actually reached out to Allison for help finding a counselor. And wouldn't you know it, I have a clip of that haunting voicemail. Have a listen. Hey, uh, Micah. Um... This is my new number, please, and if it's anybody, but I just wanted to see you, your counselor, I want to help you. You can walk through forgiveness and stuff and um, keep your heart right through all the mess. I don't want to, I don't want to lose myself in this. I don't want to pursue anything out of anger or vengeance or anything like that. I just want to be free of peace to keep my soul right. So, um, if you could text me and make me another good counselor, you know I greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Allison Williams claims that John Paul's own mental health deteriorated as his marriage to Micah fell apart. She says he started buying guns, making him unsafe to be around their children. A hearing on all of this is set for tomorrow, and it could include a court-ordered psych exam. A completely separate hearing was supposed to take place today. And that was to figure out who should get all of Micah's things, you know, her belongings that are now in the hands of law enforcement. Instead, the parties came to an agreement on their own, and it was decided that Micah's family attorney will, for the time being, hold on to her purse and her phone and the car that she had. And um, apparently, when the sheriff releases them, that will be determined as to where everything's going to go. Uh, But eventually that car will go to Micah's godmother because Micah's godmother holds the title to it. Micah's family and John Paul um, further agreed to mutual restraining orders against each other, barring either party from selling or damaging marital assets or accruing debt or even harassing each other. Pleased to be joined now by Micah Miller's father, Michael Francis, and also uh, Micah's family attorney, Regina Ward. Thank you to, to both of you. Michael, I'd like to just Thank start you. with you, if I can. And the reaction to the claims that are made in Allison Williams' lawsuit, I mean, to me, they were absolutely jaw-dropping. Were these new claims to you about what she alleges happened during her marriage to John Paul? No. It was not new information to me, just because 
uh, well, first, I, it was shared with me, and I knew that Micah was in contact with Allie because I was with Micah during some of those texts. I was with Micah when she said she needed to reach out to Allie for some help. And uh, we were aware that, that he had issues with uh, younger people in the church, and even even very, very close to home, we had people that would tell us, you know, that it's, they do not... Uh, want their kids around him, and this is one of the things that he would do was oppress uh, younger kids into just staying. I mean, this is you know this is this is what I've been told uh, caused them to uh, just want to be there and yield and end up in a situation that it's compromising to their families and compromising to their morals. And um, this is uh, just something that is 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 quite shocking. Uh, but at the same time, it is, if you see his messages, if you hear the things he talks about, um, there's a lot of fore- foreshadowing. There's a lot of uh, demeaning talk towards women. And uh, there is, uh, and it's just laughed off. And it is, uh, it's not a shock. What, what Allison put out is, uh, we much appreciate it. It is, couldn't be better timing in a sense of uh, helping people understand the character of this man. And, um, it's, it's very important. The truth is out. Allison is a truthful person, so is Micah. And um, we need more people that can vouch and show. I mean, they've been answered in court as being truthful people, so we need to listen to them. Regina, as an attorney, um, I'd like you to, to weigh in on the um, allegations that Allison makes. I mean, these are, these are big. Uh, repeatedly unfaithful, okay, I have heard that before, but regularly hiring prostitutes, and then this bombshell, quote, sexually inappropriate with several underage female members, end quote, of Solid Rock Church. She says that these female members spoke to her and tried to get justice, but were told by police, he's a pastor, um, it's not going to happen. And the fact that Allison tried to speak to the police, she says the police just said, You're, you'll look like a disgruntled um, party to a, to a divorce. As an attorney, give me your thoughts. Yeah, the um, I've actually read those pleadings that were filed, and Allison had mentioned that when she went to tell the police about what these um, young women had or young ladies had told her about, that there was a concern that with all the circumstances surrounding it, that it may not, uh, you know, take it seriously. Uh, that's really disconcerting. Uh, they should have gone and investigated further, in my opinion and uh, looked a little further into that. Unfortunately, whenever divorce pleadings are filed, um, about every action that you take, people are, or I shouldn't say people, but the, the judges or the opposing counsel are suspicious that whatever you're doing may be something to, um, you know, um, get yourself ahead well, in your own divorce. the other party, right? That, yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, that's why, I mean, listen, matrimonial law is some of the most uh, difficult, uh, some of the most uh, uh, egregious and acrimonious courtrooms in the, the country, our, our family court. Um, and I just want to reiterate that, again, you know, John Paul has not been charged with anything. And so these are allegations right. made in court filings. Uh, but, but, Michael, I've got to ask mm-hmm. you, did Micah ever let on that any of these same behaviors that... Allie is alleging happened during her marriage to, to JP. Yes. Bingo. That's the thing I'm talking about as far as she's truthful, Mike's truthful. The court's already shown that they are truthful people, so we need to listen to them. Same things occurred during Allie's marriage that occurred during Micah's marriage to this man. And uh, like I said, I was there for some of the texts. I was there for some of it. And that's one reason why I brought up the prostitution portion for Micah herself, because people would, were, you know, he was trying to convince people that she's crazy. She's just, uh, you know, just coming up with stuff yeah. off the top of her head. No, Allison experienced the same things. So, yes. Very Can important. you be specific at, at all, Michael, yeah. about what incidents um, Michael had told you, the family members that she dealt with during her marriage to JP that, that mirrored what Allie's saying? Well, um, let's see. Well, just just the fact that it just seems to be like no big deal for John Paul to suddenly just say, let's let's go grab a prostitute after dinner or whatever. 
just notch a lot, and then basically just force Allison or Micah to be, you know, in, in, in at least the view of this, and at least the exposure to it. Even just the process of looking for somebody to do that is just so baffling to me that that he just does this. And um, it would it'd be great if some more people came forward about this, you know, that would uh, that have more details. It's, I don't have details. I just know that it occurred. I mean, that's just awful, just th- those thoughts. Uh, uh, the allegations are awful on their own as well. And to hear that um, it's possible that it may have happened with, with Micah as well. Again, I have to reiterate, John Paul has not been charged at this point. Um, but I believe that there is still uh, a heavy investigation um, that is taking place. I'm very thankful to, to both of you for taking time, especially on this very busy day. And we'll check in with you again because the process is ongoing tomorrow and um, after that as well. So, Michael Francis and Regina Ward, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Still to come, a courtroom shocker today in Italy. Amanda Knox went back to clear her name once and for all, but instead she was convicted for a second time of slander. Is that justice or is it payback? for an overturned murder conviction. What are the Italians up to? After a break, I'll be joined by the man who was at Amanda's side when both were wrongly convicted of murder, her former boyfriend, Raffaele Solecito. The exclusive interview, next. This really should have been the day that Amanda Knox has been waiting for for 17 years. Final vindication, like final resolution of a nightmare that started with the murder of her British roommate back when they were both exchange students in Italy, but it was not to be. For the second time, a court in Florence convicted Amanda Knox of slander and sentenced her to three years in prison. She'd already been convicted of this crime and the verdict had already been thrown out, but the Italians decided to try her again and have now convicted her again. And yes, she does plan to appeal to the Italian Supreme Court. Um, Here is the better news in all of this. She's not actually going to have to serve another day in prison in Italy um, because she already spent four years, (laughs) right? She spent four years in prison after she and her then-boyfriend, Raffaele Solicito, were wrongfully convicted of murder. They spent four years behind bars for that. So, yeah, this three-year thing today is considered time served. She is, however, on the hook for the legal fees and victims' compensation. And the victim of Knox's so-called slander is her former boss, a bar owner whom she wrongly implicated in the murder during the investigation. At the time, she'd been interrogated for 53 hours and was less than fluent in Italian. And she quickly recanted, but the man spent two weeks in jail before his alibi was confirmed. As for today's verdict, Knox's attorney sent us this statement, which reads in part, let me read it for you. Um, We are very disappointed by the decision that we consider as a wrongful conviction. With the utmost respect for the court, We consider this decision ungrounded, and we will file appeal against it before the Italian Supreme Court. So, no resolution, and certainly no vindication. And there are very few people who know what it's like to be convicted over and over again by Italian courts. But Raffaele Solecito does know. He's Amanda's former boyfriend, and he was wrongfully convicted and jailed right alongside her all of those years ago, He's also the author of Honor Bound, My Journey to Hell and Back with Amanda Knox. He joins me now for his first interview since today's decision. Raffaele, welcome back to the program. It's nice to see you again. Um, If our viewers remember, you you were on the program. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like yesterday, but it was back in October when you joined me because they, you know, the court announced it was going to try Amanda again. And I remember you saying these words, you were delighted and you were glad because you believed that the slander conviction would be overturned. So what's your reaction to the decision today? 
Yeah, I'm disappointed too, actually. But uh, uh, after a second thought, uh, I, uh, I'm starting to feel like uh, the Court of Florence has uh, something against us because uh, I, each time we went, and I went also in the Court of Florence to ask for compensation for my um, um, time in jail, um, that was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that was... Uh, a wrongful uh, conviction. The wrongful conviction, uh, they they actually denied it. And each time we went into that court, uh, everything went bad. And, and, I mean, I'm starting to think like that at the end. Well, but every, that leads me... You, you just appeal there, everything goes wrong. So that leads me to my next question, and that is, do you think that the court really believes that Amanda had an, in, you know, um, an intention to, to defame, I think his name was Patrick Lumumba, um, or do you think this is payback, that the court just wanted to punish in any way it could, and so this was the only way it could? I think that the court wanted, wanted to punish uh, her or me or whatever in, the, in this case because they really believe she is, uh, she is guilty. That's the, the thing that that's what I think and I believe. Do you think they think that she's guilty of slander or do you think they think she's guilty of both slander and murder, but that she got away with it? Is that what you think the court believes? Yeah, because the court of Florence in the they decided for the second appeal um, that we had and we were convicted of murder and slander. Her as of slander, of course, so upon it. So uh, they really, they really sentenced that. So in the past, and it was overturned in the Supreme Court, but uh, they never have uh, an, a, any other uh, position than uh, being certain that uh, we were responsible. Can you talk to me a little bit about that 53-hour interrogation? Because Amanda, you know, talked about police. Um, you know, we've got our own stories here in the United States of interrogations that have been just, you know, wholesale uh, psychological torture at times. Um, but Amanda says that they, they promised her things. They talked her into saying things in those 53 hours. Um, I know in your book, Honor Bound, you talked about... Um, that they tried repeatedly to get you to say that you weren't with Amanda and that they promised you you could, you could go. As soon as you said that, you could go. T tell me some other things about that interrogation that uh, you were both in. Actually, that interrogation uh, is completely illegal, and that's the point of all the story in this uh, verdict, because uh, actually whatever she said, I mean, false confessions, there is a big literature on them in the end. And uh, it, we were actually taken for more than 15 years in the police station. There, is, there are no records, no taping, nothing, just the summaries written by the detectives. And they could say whatever they wanted in the end. And that's the reason why in every single um, hearing and in every single judgment of, in this case, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, um, I mean, our... Um, uh, our interrogation was uh, considered illegal and, and c could not be taken seriously as the proof of evidence. That's, uh, I mean, and I'm really surprised at the end of this journey because also the European Court uh, sentenced Italy uh, to, um, because they didn't, uh, they didn't respect our rights during the interrogation. Also in Italy as well, there was another verdict that uh, because the, pol the detectives they tried to uh, allegate uh, they tried to um, um, bring Amanda into trial because uh, of slander from her toward the, pol the policeman because she, she repeatedly uh, told that she was eaten on the back on the chin uh, when she was interrogated. And they tried to also to uh, bring her into the courtroom, but they failed. And the uh, in another courtroom, 
the judge also said that uh, in, uh, it, uh, actually they w the detectives they were the ones that failed mm. Amanda and failed her well, rights. I so I'm, be, I'm really be... surprised this, with this verdict in the end. Yeah, I am too. And I will be fascinated to find out what happens, um, you know, on appeal. But I'm so thankful, uh, Raffaele, that you would speak with us again. I'll let our viewers know again, your book is called Honor Bound, My Journey to Hell and Back with Amanda Knox. Thank you so much, Raffaele. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here today. I hope to see you again. And also coming up next graphic and heartbreaking video of a young man having a full-on mental health crisis and begging for medication. Isaiah Trammell died three days after his 10-hour ordeal at a county jail in Ohio. But what exactly happened here? What didn't happen that should have? And how much responsibility do these deputies bear? The answer might surprise you. Isaiah's father joins me live next. This is kind of a tough story for me because it involves a profession that is nasty and, and it's ugly and it's thankless and it is indispensable. Society just could not function without it. If you ever watch reality shows, you see what police and sheriff's deputies and jail intake officers have to deal with every hour. Violent people, sick people, people under every kind of chemical influence, abusive, aggressive, disrespectful, dangerous Jail officers are trained and conditioned to deal with anything, or at least they should be. But in a very, very disturbing case that I'm about to show you, uh, training and conditioning failed miserably. And a 19-year-old who never should have been locked up in the first place is dead. I'm going to show you some video, and it's going to be difficult to watch. But this is Dayton, Ohio, Montgomery County. Isaiah Trammell is picked up on an outstanding warrant in March of last year. A neighborhood called 911 because Isaiah was hitting his head against a wall due to his autism. But police didn't know that Isaiah suffered from that severe disorder and that he was about to lose control of himself to the point where officers couldn't control him either. Again, a big warning here. This video of Isaiah in custody and his treatment by deputies is very difficult to watch and to hear. Isaiah Tremel was panicking and struggling in that jail for 10 hours before an ambulance took him to a hospital. He had struck his own head against the wall so many times and so hard that three days after that video was recorded, Isaiah died. And the official cause of his death was suicide. I'm joined now by Kelsey Trammell, Isaiah's father, and Sarah Gelsomino, the Trammell family attorney. Thank you both uh, for being here. And Kelsey, I'm so incredibly sorry for the ordeal that your son went through and what your whole family is going through. It is so difficult to watch that video. I can't imagine what it's like for you. It's been almost a year. Have you had any response from the authorities, any explanation, any apologies? Um, as of right now, we haven't received anything from the authorities. We've just been kind of Nothing. waiting by. 
nothing. I mean, it, it, it defies... It defies just humanity. No one has reached out to you, not even any liaison officers, anybody regarding this, this terrible tragedy. Uh, as of right now, no, we, we haven't received anything um, from anyone in regards to Isaiah. Um, but I will say that we miss him quite a bit. Um, he was a fantastic human being and a great person to be around. Um, and like I said, we truly, truly miss him. As I understand it, and please, Kelsey, correct me if I'm wrong, with Isaiah's severe autism, the voices and the, and the pain in his head that he would describe could only end with medication or by banging his head against the wall. Is that your experience living with, with Isaiah? So growing, Isaiah growing up, um, you know, due to his autism, he would have episodes and um, it's called stimming. And what it does is it allows them to self-soothe and kind of uh, self-calm themselves. Sarah, it, it doesn't make sense for all of us out here. Um, all we can think of is that Jail officers see all kinds of things, and they're supposed to be trained, especially if there's a mental health crisis. How was this not flagged? How did nobody think that he needed medication? How did no expert, you know, assess him and, and maybe take him to a psychiatric ward or somewhere where someone could help him? And those are all of the questions that we're asking here. Unfortunately... That's really all he needed. He just needed to go to the hospital. And the family of Isaiah had used the criminal legal system before to like call the police to ask for help to get him to the hospital, to get him the help that he needed, that, the help that he asked for once he was in uh, the custody of this jail. There are, there are no answers for why that didn't happen, and there are no excuses for why it didn't happen. This was a very straightforward situation. They identified him as being in a mental health crisis. That's why he was on suicide watch. As you can see, he's in a suicide vest. That's suicide watch. He was flagged. And, you know, the fact that they just stood by for so long while he caused himself so much harm is inexcusable. Um, this, this poor young man suffered so greatly and so unnecessarily for too long. And we should also mention that you can see we digitized and blocked out parts of videos where he's naked. I mean, that was something else, I understand, Kelsey, that made him very agitated if he was ever naked. And there he was, stripped of his clothing, whether it was for the, you know, his own well-being and the suicide prevention. But, uh, you know, it's, it's so difficult to, to see this. I think some of the viewers might be wondering why he was even in jail in the first place. And, and even that seems to be a grave error. Uh, there was a warrant because of a, a call that was made. His sister had called saying that they were worried about him and needed a welfare check. How on earth would that have ended in a warrant? Kelsey, can you hear me? I'm sorry, can you say that again? I apologize, I didn't hear you. Yeah, no, it, it seems like it just seemed even the warrant that brought him into the jail in the first place seemed so out of place. Uh, his sister had called, worried about his safety, and had asked for a, a, a welfare check, and that somehow ended up as, as a warrant. Yeah, that's strange to us as well. Um, it wasn't the first time that we've called uh, Montgomery County sheriffs uh, in the past. Um, usually when he would have his episodes and go through what he did, we would always uh, call the sheriff's department to have them come out to make sure that he was okay, that he wouldn't cause any kind of harm to himself or, or anything like that. Sarah, so I only it, have five they, seconds left, but I, I have to, so I'm so sorry, I have to ask, um, is the family considering legal action against Montgomery County? Yes, absolutely. Kel Kelsey and Isaiah's family want to make sure that they can do anything that they will do anything that's within their power to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else, not in j this jail and hopefully not in any others. 
So they're certainly considering all of their options, including a, a lawsuit here. Well, we would very much like to follow this story. So please stay in touch with us. And we'd like to see what resolution and justice you can get for not only, you know, Isaiah's family, but for Isaiah as well. Um, Kelsey Tremel and Sarah Gelsomino, thank you both so much. Really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next, after 58 years, you might think you got away with it, depending on what it is. And you might be right, but not if it's murder. And a 79-year-old Missouri man is living proof. Police say he stabbed a young wife and mom 125 times back in 1966. And finally, they say justice is being served. The victim's daughter joins me live when we come back. Neighborhood info. Homes.com. Next time you hear about a cold case that seems unsolvable, I want you to remember Karen Snyder. Karen was a young wife and mother, and I do mean young. She was 18 when she was stabbed to death in her own home back in 1966. This was in Calumet City, Illinois, just outside Chicago. A suspect early on emerged. He was one of her husband's co-workers, and he even ended up as a pallbearer at Karen Snyder's funeral. And uh, not a word of a lie here. The man showed up the day of the funeral with cuts on his arms, which authorities say his own wife noticed the night of the murder. Allegedly, he came home that night acting, quote, nervous and immediately washed his clothes. But for some reason, he wasn't charged, and the case eventually went cold. Lucky for the Snyder's family, though, police held on to that evidence year after year, up to 57 years. And state-of-the-art DNA tests finally led right back to that pallbearer, James Barbier. There he is, now 79 years old and living in Missouri. And what exactly prompted the Calumet City Police to take another look? A phone call from a 28-year-old man who'd grown up hearing stories about the murder from his grandmother. I'm joined now by Karen Snyder's daughter, Paula Larson, and by Kevin Seeley, the man who placed that call, and as it turns out, a man who was Paula's fourth cousin. Welcome to both of you. Paula, it's just an incredible story, honestly. Um, To think back, you were, I think, two months old when your mother was so viciously murdered, you never got a chance to, to even know her, but how does it feel to know that almost six decades later, there's, there's a suspect arrested and charged. It's very surreal. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. I never thought that we would get here. And if it weren't for Kevin's call, we wouldn't be here. I think that's the next biggest question. Kevin, you have, up until now, discovering that you're fourth cousins with Paula, you really didn't have much of a connection other than hearing your grandmother's stories once upon a time, why did you pick up the phone and say, it's time to reopen this? Hmm. Uh, sitting at the kitchen table with my grandma, she would talk about it every once in a while. I've probably heard the story about five times, and then I end up reading the story and seeing what happened to her, and she deserves justice, and it's been well overdue. I mean, I'll say 57 years. Paula, I don't understand how it is possible that that suspect showed up as a pallbearer at your mom's funeral with cuts and that his wife has said he had them that night and washed his clothes and was agitated. Why was it that they didn't actually look into him further and make the arrest back then? I do believe that, from what I'm told, that he... He was uh, noticed that day, and that's when the police started to to question him. But they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him, charge him, I should say. Wow, it's so hard to believe, right? There's pictures of him. uh, He's free uh, due to his age and health. Apparently, he's not being remanded in custody. He's awaiting 
his trial um, as a free man, right? Like, this is sort of incre- incredible to think that he's, he's been out for so long, 57 years of freedom, and it continues. I do want to ask, and either one of you can answer this, but what, what is the suspected, sus- like, connection? Other than the fact that he was, you know, the co-worker of uh, the husband, what, what was the connection to Karen? What, why would he murder Karen? What, what, are, what are the theories? From what I've been told, um, the two gentlemen, my father and this man, were co-workers and their wives were friends. And other than that, I couldn't speculate why this happened it i mean i mean you can imagine so but i i don't have any facts yeah so many years later um couldn't even imagine and again he's only charged he's not convicted at this time james barbier but paula what would justice look like to you in this case justice if if he is convicted, then he should serve what he's got coming to him. He should go to jail for the rest of his natural life. And that would be the end of that story. And Kevin, I mean, I, it seems so many years removed from, from you and your generation, but what would justice feel like and look like and be for you? Uh, same thing as Paula. He needs to be convicted and just spend the rest of his natural life in prison where he belongs. Should have been there for 57 years now. So He's already been on probation for 57 yes. years. That's a good way of putting it. Um, Paula Larson and Kevin Seeley, thank you both so much. We want to follow this, so please come back on the program and let's, um, let's find out what happens together. Thank you for this tonight. Thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right, and a note about tomorrow. Um, I've heard some pretty crazy things, but there is this uh, defendant that doesn't want to show his face in court and made a huge demand of the judge for makeup. I would love to know how you feel about that. Do you think that defendant should be able to put a ton of makeup on his face to hide what he doesn't want the court to see? Wait until you hear what it is he's trying to hide. That's all coming tomorrow on this program. Thanks so much for watching tonight. In the meantime, uh, stay tuned because you know who's coming next. It's Chris Cuomo. Don't miss that.